This Muslim man challenges this Christian preacher on the Bible in a heated debate. Muhammad says repeatedly in the Quran, Jesus is not God. The Quran is not the words of Muhammad. And he even tries to embarrass the Christians in front of everybody. The Quran is the word of Allah. This is the simplest fact that you don't know. Okay. And there is only one Quran. We do have tens of different versions of the Quran right. like the Bible. But what happens next literally shocks everyone watching. Those we believe and every time we, we mention the name of Jesus or Moses, we will say peace be upon them. Good. Just before we get to this heated exchange, I want you to watch how this other Christian preacher proves to this Muslim man that Jesus Christ is God in just under 60 seconds. Watch this. Be somewhere that Jesus said, I am God or worship me. He never said it. He said, don't call me God, only the Father is God. Jesus did not say, do not call me God. He says, why do you call me God? Asking that question is not the same as saying, don't call me God. According to the Quran, who is the first? God. Allah, yes. yes. Yeah. So the Quran says, Allah is the first. The Quran says, Allah is the last. This is Jesus speaking. Behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Who is the beginning and the end? Islamic. Right. So Jesus is calling himself God. If, if Jesus was God, do you not think that, that that would have been a pivotal message? That would have been like something clear, like, look, I am God. He did, he did make it clear. I'll show you where he says that you should worship him. So Jesus says this, so that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. Now, who is the Father? God. How do you honor God? You bow down and worship him. So Jesus is literally saying, bow down and worship him. I'm not lying to you, bro. That's right, the Christian preacher is not lying at all and he's proved this point using scripture and you can tell by the silence of the Muslim gentleman at the end. I'm not lying to you, bro. There's no argument anyone can bring to bear against scripture that will not be proven to be false. And in case you're wondering, I'm not being arrogant. I am simply stating that scripture is its own defense. And anyone who's led by the Spirit of God and has studied it carefully can defend scripture, and more precisely in this case, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Other Muslims claim to love Jesus, however, they would never worship Jesus because they don't think he is God. And their Jesus is different from the Jesus of scripture who deserves our worship and to whom one day every knee will bow. He is the faithful witness. Bow the knee before him and worship him. He is the firstborn of the dead. Worship him. He is the ruler of kings on earth. I don't care what your position is. I don't care what your possessions are. Bow the knee and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's get back to the heated debate I told you about earlier. And I want you to watch the arrogance of the Muslim men and the humility and patience of the Christian preacher throughout the entire exchange. Watch this. Muhammad says repeatedly in the Quran, Jesus is not God. The Quran said, the, the Quran is not the words of Muhammad. All right, fine. The Quran is the word of Allah. This is the simplest fact that you don't know. Okay. And there is only one Quran. We do have, we do have tens of different versions of the Quran, right. like the Bible. You bet. There is one single Quran. Right. And bring me a single proof that two Qurans, not they have two different pages, but two different sentences. I will challenge you. Good. Bring the Quran from 100 years ago, 200, 500, even 1000, 1400 years ago. Right. All of them, everything is written in the same sentence. There, there isn't a single vowel is different. You bet. Leave alone. We, do have, we have this Bible. We have this Bible. Right. The old one, the new one, the green one, the yellow one, the, the tall one, the short one. No. You bet. Why? I tell you why. It's written in the Quran. A lot has been changed. All right. A lot of those books have been changed, but if, if, you, if Allah sends the book, Allah oh. sends the Quran, and He promised in it, He said that I will protect it. The last two were, were John the Baptist, and then we have Jesus. He too was killed. By the way, Jesus wasn't killed. Allah says in the Quran, He took him and He brought a man like Jesus. We thought He was killed, but He wasn't. Because Allah would not allow any harm to come to Jesus. Those we believe, and every time we, we mention the name of Jesus or Moses, we will say, peace be upon them. Good. Now, please answer my question now. Ask Very me. simple question. Shoot. Matthew, <laughs> Mark, Luke, and John, eyewitnesses of Christ, record, we heard Jesus claim to be God. You reject that. You accept a man who lived 500 years after Christ, who never met Christ. You accept his testimony that Jesus is not God over the eyewitnesses. Why do you do that? Why? Other than that you believe the Quran's the word of God. See, you, you, you can't answer that. 
Just like that, the arrogance of the Muslim men was brought to nothing. As he was seeking to embarrass the Christian preacher, he ended up being the one embarrassed and left without saying a single word to the question he was asked. As the book of Proverbs says in Proverbs 16 verse 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. I just hope that this Muslim man was convicted of the errors of the Quran and comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I think it's also worth noting that the same way you see those arguments for Muslims, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and countless of other false religions fall at the feet of scripture, it is in like manner that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everyone without exception will bow down and worship Jesus Christ because he is God. And it's also the focal point of John's message here in this first segment from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. Christ is worthy of worship first because he's God. Christ is also worthy of worship, however, because he is the faithful witness. Not, not, not just a faithful witness. He is the faithful witness. And what is meant here is that Christ is a witness who can only be faithful because he's God, he's perfect, he's truth, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He can only be a faithful witness. But it's also meant here that Christ is the only witness who has been and always will be faithful. There have been other witnesses and we're grateful for them. You could have a heavenly roll call. You could say, Adam, Adam, can you come and testify? And Adam would have to say, actually, no, I was kind of unfaithful. Oh, okay, Abraham, how about you come and, and Abraham, you testify. I, 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 I could, but I, yeah, that faults, frailties, sins, you, 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 you don't want me. Well, David, can you, uh, Bathsheba, well, well, <laughs> and we could go on and on and on and on, and there would only be one, only one. All the rest are good witnesses, amen? All the rest are, rest are reliable witnesses, but all the rest of them are frail and flawed witnesses. But there is one witness who can only be faithful. And he is the one witness who was and is and always will be faithful. He is worthy of worship as the faithful witness. That's why we don't offer worship to Adam or to Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or to anyone else. We offer worship to God alone. Christ is God and he's the faithful witness. Secondly, we offer worship to him. He's worthy of worship, rather, because he's the firstborn of the dead. He's the firstborn of the dead. I was having a, a conversation with a Jehovah's Witness not long ago, and you know, Jehovah's Witnesses argue that Jesus is the first created being, and they look at a number of texts, and you know, they always, you know, he, especially Colossians one, and you know, the firstborn of all creation. What that means is, you know, that God created him first, and then after God created him, he created everything else. And that word "firstborn" there in Colossians one um, means preeminent. Firstborn does does not always mean the first one born. Um, God calls Israel his firstborn son. Israel was not the first nation born, but they are the preeminent nation in terms of God's people. And here, Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, but he's he the first one who died and got up. Actually, he's not. There was another. You remember Lazarus. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Not, not only that, but we, we know that the Old Testament prophet Elijah raised someone from the dead. So this idea of Jesus being the firstborn of the dead does not mean that he's the first one who died and came back, but it means that he's preeminent. Why is he preeminent? Well, for a couple of reasons. Number one, he's preeminent because his resurrection was unlike anything else. 
the one whom Elijah raised, and even the one who Jesus raised have something in common. They're dead. Amen? I just, for me, I, that, that always just gets me when I, when I read, when I read about Lazarus. I, I'm like excited, but, and here's why. Lazarus is, Lazarus is dead. He's gone. He's with, he's with the Lord. He's, 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 it's all good. And then he comes back to this. Worse than that, right? I mean, I can imagine, I can imagine people there, you know, Lazarus, maybe not immediately, but after a few days, you know, like Lazarus, you, the Lord raised you from the dead. You should be the happiest man in the world. What's wrong? And he would say, I got to do that again. I was finished. I was over. I had faced that last enemy that we all fear and dread. And now I got to do it again. Not Jesus. He rose again on the third day, never to die again. He defeated death and hell and the grave. So he's firstborn of the dead because of that. But he's also firstborn of the dead because all others who hope for, anticipate, and will experience resurrection from the dead will experience resurrection not only like he did, but because he did. We will overcome death because of Christ, the firstborn of the dead. He is worthy of worship because he's God, because he's the faithful witness, and because he's the firstborn of the dead. Thirdly, he's the ruler of kings on earth. He's the ruler of kings on earth. It's an amazing thing to meet a king. Amen? Or a president, for example. I mean, even if it's a president that you don't like. And I know people talk noise about, you know, our current president, and rightly so. Lord have mercy. But, but, <laughs> but here's the thing. No matter what you think about a president, and people's passions run deep, if he invited you in and you stood before him, your knees would shake because of the office. If you stood there in the Oval Office waiting for the door to open and for the President of the United States to walk in, your breathing would not be as calm as it is right now because of the office. It's an amazing thing. But Christ is the ruler of kings on earth. the ruler of every king on earth. The ruler of every king that has ever been and every king that ever will be. He is king of kings and lord of lords. Every knee will bow before him and every tongue will confess. Everyone. All of the rest of the kings on earth are kings of a limited domain. There are many kings in the world right now, but none of them are my king. Amen? Not nary a one. I have another king. And even if I did live in a monarchy where there was a king, that king might be my king here and now. But as we were reminded of just a while back, even those monarchs who rule for what seems like ages and eons and lifetimes, they die. And when they die, it's like when the queen just died recently. What do you say? The queen is dead, long live the king. But there is a king who will never die. And he is the king above all other kings. He is worthy of our worship. If you look at the next part of this verse, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins and made us a kingdom of priests to his father and God. By the way, there's another three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. But 
Just grasp this from a literary perspective for a moment. Christ is worthy of worship, first because he's God. And it's as though John is saying, he's God, worship him. He is the faithful witness. Bow the knee before him and worship him. He is the firstborn of the dead. Worship him. He is the ruler of kings on earth. I don't care what your position is. I don't care what your possessions are. Bow the knee and worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And then just before your knee goes down to worship him, you know what John would say? Get up, you're not worthy. You are not worthy to worship Christ. What an incredible position to be in. You owe God worship. You owe the Lord Jesus Christ worship. You owe him all of your worship, and you're not worthy to give him the worship that you owe. Any worship that you would offer him would be tainted worship. It would be beneath him unworthy of who he is as God, unworthy of who he is as the faithful witness, unworthy of who he is as the firstborn of the dead and as the ruler of kings on earth. And then right when you're about to be crushed under the weight of the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ, John says to him who loves us, He's God. He's God. He's the faithful witness. He's the firstborn of the dead. He's the ruler of kings on earth. There is none like him. And he loves me. He is worthy of me bowing prostrate on my face before him and praying that I'm not consumed by the fire of his judgment. And he loves me. He loves me. <laughs> love is an amazing and significant thing, but not all loves are equal. Amen? My, my dogs love me. Man. They do, they love me. If you fed them, they'd love you too. <laughs> so I'm glad my dogs love me. But they don't love me like my kids love me. It means more to me that my kids love me. And they don't love me like my wife loves me. It, it means more to me that my wife loves me. But not my dogs or my kids or my wife Love me like my Savior loves me. There is no love like that love. Why? Who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Christ demonstrated his love for us, or God demonstrated his love for us in this, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ who said, greater love had no man than this, then he laid down his life for his friends. So when John says that, that he, he loves us, he's not just saying that he has warm feelings toward us. No, no, no. Love is an act of the will accompanied by emotion that leads to action on behalf of its object. He demonstrated his love in freeing us from our sins. There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And yet he has freed us from our sins by his blood. He paid the penalty for our sins with his blood. And he made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. 
So watch this. Christ is worthy of worship because he's God and because he's the faithful witness and because he's the firstborn of the dead and because he's the ruler of kings on earth. And the most magnificent piece of this puzzle from my perspective is that not only is he worthy of worship, but he makes me worthy to worship him. Look at it again. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests before his God and Father. He has made us a kingdom of priests who are worthy to offer worship before the throne. And we are only worthy to worship because the one who is worthy of worship has loved us and freed us and redeemed us. God is good. If you have come here this morning and placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he has made you worthy to worship the one who is worthy of worship. If you have come here this morning and do not know the Lord and the pardon of your sins, if you've come here this morning and have not come to him in repentance and faith, then I would offer you this warning. What you are doing is the right thing, but you're not yet worthy to do it in the right way. Repent of your sin, flee from your sin, and cast yourself on the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in him and him alone to make you worthy. As he redeems you by his blood because of the great love with which he loves us and grant you permission to join that kingdom of priests before his God and Father. This is it for this video and let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. If this is your first time on the channel, I hope you subscribe. If not, I hope to see you on our next video. With Love in Christ, John Henry with the Gospel of Christ. Mm -hmm.